Okay, James 3, we're going to pick up in 13. And he's sort of, uh, he's sort of changing subjects here. He's, he's kind of going back. He's going to go back. If you notice verse 1, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. We talked through that. It's almost like he's going to go back and pick that theme of thought up again in verse 13, because he's going to start talking about the way you live your life and, and how that matters. So somebody go ahead and read 13, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So if you're wise, welcome, and you understand God's ways, they're doing your Bible Sunday, right? Okay, good day to be on time. Just No, I mean, you know, because they'll do it at the beginning. So tell Bailey to cooperate and Cade. So, right. We're in James 3, verse 13. If you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. So, the, the people that write about these things, they see a call back to that that thing in verse one where he's saying, if there is there any among you who wishes to be a real sage and a real teacher, it's kind of that thought again. If so, live a life of such beautiful graciousness that he will prove to all that gentleness is enthroned as the controlling power of his heart. And we're always totally under control, right? Um or if I'm a teacher and I really want to discount and make my teaching less effective, well, if I get out of control at times, it really is going to discount what you hear me say. Because, well, he says that, but then he doesn't even control himself. So that seems to be kind of the, the vein of thought there. And so then he says in 14, but if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. So there's a word he uses there in the, the New American Standard uses the word zeal. Zeal that is bitter or bitter jealousy. And there's some interesting history with the words there because the, the Greek word for zeal isn't bad in and of itself. Uh, it can and often does mean noble emulation, something that you ought to do. Uh, a man would feel this when he's confronted with some picture of greatness or goodness. But then there's this narrow dividing line that comes between noble emulation and ignoble envy and jealousy. And, and obviously, if we start operating from a place of jealousy, that, that's never smiled on in Scripture. Ever, anybody ever get, been in a relationship with, ship with somebody that was jealous? How'd that work? Oh, don't, you don't have to look, you don't have to do eyes. He's starting to fight in here, not even intended. Uh, but, but I mean, we all understand jealousy is not, it's the opposite of trust. It's, it's not smiled on. It doesn't look good. It's definitely not what we want to portray as Christians. But then the other part of this, the, the words that are translated selfish ambition, if there's selfish ambition in your heart. Again, these were words that originally had no bad meaning, but they were words where the meaning changed over time. Originally, these words meant spinning for hire as other words, women who serve. Uh, it came to be, mean work that was done for pay. They were ambitious. They were, you know, they would they would hire themselves out. But then it came to mean work that was solely being done for what could be gotten out of it. And a teacher, somebody who's helping to try to bring Christians along, you're not doing that for solely what can be got out of it. But then these words entered the political realm and it came to mean that selfish ambition um, it's it's a person that's just out for themselves and nothing else. And, you know, politically that happens to people. They get involved for all the right reasons and they get a bit corrupted and for long it's all about self-preservation. And so 
again, he's using terms here where if this is who you are trying to live the Christian life, you're going to have a problem. And so with those words in the background, Barclay contends that scholars and teachers, often one and the same, are under a double temptation. First, there's a temptation toward arrogance. Have you sat in a class with an arrogant professor? We've been there, probably somewhere along the way. And, and now we talked about this before as it related to Jewish rabbis, the way they were put on a pedestal, the way they were looked up to, the way they were given preferential treatment, all the, the everything was just right for them to become very arrogant as teachers. And, and so back to verse one, let not many of you become teachers in the church for if we who teach will be judged more strictly. You know, there's a temptation to arrogance. Uh, he gives us this from the sayings of the fathers, I guess, Jewish fathers. It rests with thy colleagues to choose whether they will adopt thy opinion. It's not for thee to force it upon them. You know, I'm going to put it out there. It's them. One other interesting point that ought to have preachers and teachers on guard. Preachers and teachers become very used to telling people things and being listened to. And if you are used to being listened to, what are you not used to having to do yourself? You don't do a lot of listening. And so the, the temptation to arrogance is there, but then also the temptation to not to be a continued learner yourself. And so for all these reasons, now, do we need more teachers here? Obviously. You know, verse one should not be our cop out to not get involved in teaching but if we do get involved in teaching we've got to be on guard against arrogance upon no longer being learners ourselves uh, and and if i'm teaching the bible what are some reasons that there should never be any room for for arrogance I'm imperfect. Yeah, I'm absolutely. So that aspect of humility, and I think there's another aspect of humility that, that has to be there with teaching. Have I learned all of this? Um, we, we teach, we should teach and present, this is my best understanding of what the Bible's teaching. This is my best understanding right now. Of what the Bible's teaching. Did you interact with Ed Gallagher? Ed has spoken here. But I love the way Ed writes. I mean, he's a scholar. He's probably forgotten more than I know. But but he'll write and he'll say, this is where I am on this today. But he's always learning and he's always reading and he's always studying. And so all he's saying is, this is where I am today, but I'm open to the idea, I may not have it right and I think there's a humility in that, that that should always be there if we're teaching. And then the other thing about it, um, do any of us like being rejected in any way? No, um, not at all. Um, I don't know. I When you're buying a house, one of the, when you're writing an offer, you know, the, you're just on pins and needles hoping that that offer doesn't get rejected. You hate rejection. If I'm teaching Bible, well, hey, a good salesman has to embrace rejection. Why? You got to go through the nose to get to the essence. I mean, that's that's sales basics 101. If you can't handle no, then you can't handle sales, right? Got to run the numbers. Right. And no doesn't always mean no, does it? Sometimes no means I not at the moment. It sometimes means I don't have the information I need yet. I mean, so yeah, it's so you don't give up. But 
when it comes to a study of scripture, if if you're if we're teaching scripture and somebody rejects what's being taught, have they rejected me? You know, one important thing to remember is if they're rejecting what's being taught, they're not rejecting me. What they're doing is they're rejecting God. They're rejecting God's word. And it may not be a permanent rejection, but it isn't. I shouldn't make it about me because it's not about me. Turn to John chapter 15. And somebody read 18 through 23 because Jesus, he talks about this. And I think it's important for us to remember if we're going to keep our minds right on this. John 15, 18 through 23. So, you know, Jesus is running it back to the source. And and I like the way the New Living Words, uh, the end of verse 20, and if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. you know, but they, they haven't listened to me, and so they're not going to listen to you. And so um, it, it's just this reminder from Jesus. And so the, uh, the temptation we might have... Um, there you know it's not about us the temptation to bitterness again in the teaching uh, in the context of those who teach uh, we're still in verse 14 but if you're bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart um, sometimes preachers and teachers and scholars disagree and they'll get into a war of words or Sometimes within the church, you'll hear about somebody getting written up because they said something that somebody didn't like. So they, they write. I got an email the other day from a preacher. Went out to all these preachers in the area, throwing another preacher under the bus. You know, and so Barclay says one of the most difficult things in the world is to argue without passion and to meet arguments without wounding why do we ever argue if it doesn't matter do you argue about it what do we why do we argue then it's because it's something we care about we care enough to have a conversation and so when we start arguing generally there's some passion there because we care and when there's passion what often ends up happening i wound the person because i'm trying to get something across related to an idea. He says to be utterly convinced on one's own beliefs without at the same time being bitter to those of others, uh, to those of others is no easy thing and yet is a first necessity of the Christian teacher and scholar. In other words, Chase and I disagree regarding what the Bible's teaching on something, but I don't disagree that I love Chase and I know God loves Chase and we know we're trying to get, to, you know, I don't start to vilify him because we have a disagreement about a point. And sometimes when we're teaching or when we're in a discussion, that can happen. And so he brings a bunch of things into this discussion out of these verses that, that can actually, you know, come up as we try to live out the life. Barclay concludes his discussion of this section by noting that these verses contain four characteristics of the wrong kinds of teaching. He says the wrong kind of teaching is fanatical. In other words, the truth it holds is held with unbalanced violence rather than with reasoned conviction. It is bitter. It regards those who disagree as enemies who must be annihilated rather than as a friend. It's the thing we were just talking about. It is selfishly ambitious. You know, it may be more about me promoting me, because if I'm promoting me and I'm right, then, you know, that that does more for me. 
And then he says it is arrogant, pride in its own knowledge rather than humility in its own ignorance. Do we know what we don't know? We don't. And, and there's still some things in here we probably haven't yet learned. And that's why we continue to study for a lifetime. And how do we know that? Have I ever been wrong about anything? Yes. How do I know that I'm still not wrong about some things right now? I don't. And so those two reminders should help us avoid arrogance. Anything else y'all want to say about 13 and 14 before we move forward? A couple of interesting verses there. Right. Yeah. Right. And and I mean, some people, you know, I guess is the term gaslighting where you like throw something out there because you know you just want to see it blow up. And some people love that. And you're not. Right. Right. Yeah, it's and it doesn't. It doesn't make Jesus look good. It doesn't make his church look good. And generally, um, well, it's a, it, and I mean, politics tend to be the same way. I mean, you, I mean, how many people change their vote based on a Facebook post? You know, and 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 the the way people's lives change through Scripture is when Scripture is studied and considered and discussed, and you know, the the public forum generally isn't going to get that done. It's a good. good Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but it's easy. I mean, because you can throw it out. You can, you know, throw your thing out there, run away, you know, start the fire and um, not be around to see what kind of mess it creates. So I wish it wasn't that way. So it's a good point you bring up. Anything else? Somebody read 15 and 16. Please. Hello. Are you in James 3? I'm sorry. It's like, I know your translation may be different, but yeah. Right. Okay. So jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Those things are earthly, unscriptural, and demonic. Um, so three characteristics, earthly, uh, based on earthly standards coming from earthly sources. Um, natural um, is one of the words that's used there or translated unscriptural in the New Living. Uh, that's from a word which is somewhat difficult, according to Barclay, to translate the sense of. It's the Greek word meaning soul, as in there's life within us that animates our body, not the soul that goes on to heaven, but we are animated by a spirit. And so it's he's saying the wrong kind of wisdom is no more than an animal kind of thing. It's the kind of wisdom which makes an animal snap and snarl with no other thought than of the prey that it's after or its own personal survival. So he's saying this jealousy and selfishness, not God's kind of wisdom. They're earthly, they're um, natural, or as in they're of the animal order. And then, of course, he says demonic. The source is not God, and if the source is not God, what's the other source? It would be the devil. And so it produces the kind of situation the devil applauds, not the kind that God would applaud, nor the kind for which Jesus died. So um, he says, wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every kind of evil deed. 
Sometimes in a company, you'll find jealousy and you'll find selfish ambition. And what kind of work environment do you normally end up with? Is that the guy you want to work with? Guy that will run over your back to make sure he gets there before you do? Is that the team spirit? I mean, y'all post a lot about team. And I think that's healthy. If it's real, that's great. I mean, and I assume it is real or you wouldn't be posting it. But I mean, y'all talk about a lot about the work you all do together. But sometimes, you know, we've all been in those situations where you got somebody that's in the mix that's, that isn't that way. And when that's in the church, how's the church going to grow? How's the church going to be healthy in the way God wants it to be healthy? And so the only way we stay on guard against, or the only way I can guard against that is I've got to be on guard against those things within me. And you got to be on guard against those things within you. And if we, you know, if everybody is self-policing in that way, then hopefully we're in a better place because we don't want to see when you've got disorder and chaos in a work environment, you want to work in a chaotic environment or do you want to go find another job? You know, and, and the same kind of thing, those kinds of things drive people apart rather than bringing them together. And as the family of God, we want the environment that brings us together because we've got important work to do together. Uh, he says, it may well be said that all forces which make for division are forces which are against the will of God and which advance the cause of the devil. And so, you know, we don't want to be divisive. And thankfully, we don't we don't have a lot of that here. And that's a good thing. We, but, but we stay on guard because what happens when you let your guard down? That's when when things can creep in. Um, somebody read 17. Which one sounds like which spirit is gentle, over sweeping, full of mercy, and good faith, heart, and sincere? There's a lot in that verse. I mean, it's one verse, and it's got this lifetime of work. Um, wisdom from above. First of all, is pure, peace loving, gentle at all times, willing to you, full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds, shows no favoritism, always sincere. I mean, it's it, it's a lifetime of work. So let's talk about pure. Um, the root meaning of the word is pure enough to approach the gods. That would have been the way the word was defined in Greek. The true wisdom is the wisdom which is so cleansed of all ulterior motives, so cleansed of self that it has become pure enough to see God. How many of us are there? You know, I read that definition and I'm like, okay, nowhere near yet. Still got a lot of work to do. So cleansed of ulterior motives, so cleansed of self that it's become pure enough to see God. I mean, that is a lofty, lofty thing to, to have as a goal. He then says, worldly wisdom might well wish to escape God's sight. The true wisdom is able to bear the very scrutiny of God. Do you really want God? Do I really want God looking at who I am? I mean, that's what he's saying. Because what I mean, God does know who I am and he can see who I am. But does it give me pause when I allow when when I know God is looking at who I really am? Or am I striving for that purity so that I can put that on display for God? Never in an arrogant way, but, but, but you understand the point. We're striving for purity. Then he says peaceable, peace loving. Um its basic meaning is right relationships between man and man and between man and God. When relationships are strained, frayed, not right, there is no peace. True wisdom is the wisdom which at all times brings men closer to one another and closer to God. And of course, we draw that one up in the marriage picture sometimes. If you put God at the top and you got a husband and wife, the closer they get to each other, who are they also getting closer to? Getting closer to God. And so peaceable, peace loving. And then a we and then the word gentle, 
Um, is that the one they used in the? Yeah, gentle at all times. It's funny because he says of all the words in the New Testament, he grandiose. It's grandiose sometimes in the way he writes. And he says of all the words in the New Testament, this is the most untranslatable. He said Aristotle defined it as that which is just beyond the written law. He further stated it to be justice and better than justice. He's the man who knows how to make allowances, the man who knows when not to stand upon his rights, the man who knows how to temper justice with mercy, the man who always remembers that there are greater things in the world than rules and regulations. Do rules and regulations matter? But sometimes do I need to stand on what's rightfully mine or do I need to be able to go beyond that a little bit for the good of somebody else? He says it's impossible to find an English word to fully translate this quality that's being grasped at here with the word gentle. Uh, one guy called it sweet reasonableness. It's the quality to extend to others the kindly consideration which we would wish to receive ourselves. Sometimes people just need to cut a slack because if they understood where they were coming from, they'd want to, right? And and really, I guess that's maybe he's saying a lot of the golden rules captured in this gentleness, the quality to extend to others, the kindly consideration which we would wish to receive to ourselves, because that was the the the, the unmerciful servant that Jesus talked about was forgiven everything. He owed more than he could repay in multiple lifetimes. And then he turns around and he wants to throw a guy in jail who owes him a little bit of money comparatively. You know, it's it's the complete opposite of what's being talked about here. Um, now, this is one where if you start thinking about this kind of person, maybe there's somebody in your life who you know who embodies this second mile person. A person who maybe will be walked over just a little bit in order to make sure they do right by people. You know, I, I, you, you might start thinking about specific individuals that embody this. And if you do, that's good. But, the, but for us, God's wisdom, the wisdom from above is gentle at all times. That's what God wants to see in me. Do you see that in Jesus, in his ministry? think you do and he and, and it wasn't that rules and regulations never mattered he said he came to fulfill the law the law mattered but you saw in him a willingness to maybe not be treated just right in order to meet the needs of somebody else and so the word gentle there there's a lot of meaning in it and then the word reasonable um Gentle at all times, the New Living says, and willing to yield to others. How many of us really enjoy yielding? Not my favorite. If you get to the light first and you're in the bigger vehicle, you know, sometimes you don't have to yield because you, you know, people defer. In the marriage, do you want to yield? Not always. Um, According to Barclay, there are two possible meanings for the Greek word being used here. First possibility, ever ready to obey, as in, I'm willing to yield. I'm ever ready to obey God. The second possibility is more likely what's going on here, though. Easy to persuade, not in the sense of being pliable and weak, a pushover, but in the sense of not being stubborn and of being willing to listen to reason and appeal. You ever thought you were right about something? And then when you got all the information, you realize, man, I was wrong about that. But there's something within you that just doesn't want to admit it. I mean, I think that's what he's speaking against here. When I realize that I'm in the wrong, I, I've got to be willing to just say I was wrong. I've probably used this example in here. Uh, Abraham Lincoln got caught up during his presidency, wanted to please a politician. 
And so he issued this command to transfer some regiments around. And when the Secretary of War, Ed Stanton, heard it, um, he just refused the order. And he said the president was a fool. Now, probably not the best choice of words from Stanton. I mean, he is the president of the United States. How would a lot of presidents react to that? Lincoln's reaction was, if Stanton said I'm a fool, then I must be, for he's nearly always right. I'll see for myself. And so he investigated, he realized he was wrong, and he rescinded the order. That's willing to yield, and that's willing to yield from the highest office in the land, and that's the kind of willing to yield that I believe James is driving at here in the verse. Um, because a lot of times, and this will be back to the internet, he called me a fool. I'll show him. I'll have his job by Sunday. Or, you know, have. And then um, it is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. Um, we'll finish with this one and, and try to catch the last verse as we start next time. But um, Barclay points out that Christian thought has an expanded meaning of this word beyond the way it would have been defined by the Greeks. For the Greeks, they would have defined this word as mercy for the man who is suffering unjustly. In other words, he's suffering and it's not his fault. For Christians, we broaden that, though, because it's, it's mercy but for people who are suffering unjustly and then for the person who's actually in trouble when the trouble is his own fault. We want to be merciful. And it's not as we ignore the law of the land and we don't put him in jail. There are going to be consequences, but it's reflecting the idea. It's the kind of mercy whereby God would send his son to pay for our sins and provide a way back. We never want to lose sight of the ultimate goal with people, which is to help them be right with God. Fruit, the fruit of good deeds, the fruit of uh, full of good fruits, uh, obviously um, mercy and positive action going together. He says, mercy, which issues in good fruits, that is mercy, which issues in practical help. Christian pity is not merely an emotion. Christian pity is an action. So, um, any anything y'all want to add on verse 17? A lot there. I mean, there's there's a lifetime of work in one verse. And so it's if there are the part to the parts of that where we're doing well, yeah, we need to celebrate that. But we read verses like that with the idea, OK, where do I need to be better? Where do I need to elevate this? Or, OK, I'm really good at yielding everywhere except at home. So is at home where I've got to work on being better at yielding? You know, we got to look at this for where it's an opportunity. Uh, for us in our lives. All right, and as I said, I guess it's the 7:28, and so I don't. We'll we'll catch verse 18. Well, it, those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. The value in being the kind of person who promotes peace, whether you're promoting that at work, it makes Jesus look good. Whether you're promoting that in the church, it makes Jesus look good. Whether you're promoting that in your family. It makes Jesus look good. We're trying to be peacemakers wherever we go and in whatever we do. So, I mean, that's being basically the last verse of the, of the chapter there. All right. I did too much talk and I didn't ask enough good questions tonight. So we'll try to be better on that next week. We'll get into chapter four. If we're fortunate, maybe we can get through four and five. I'd like to finish James so that we kind of have a clean cut off before the summer series starts. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, kind of how that goes. Any prayer requests before we finish tonight?